I would like to get us all started. Again, for our attendees, please um, please let us know in the chat which uh, where your name and uh, what school you're attending. Thanks, Alejandro, FIU. Um, and uh, since we do have a small crowd, feel free to interrupt any time with questions, not interrupt, but post your questions in, in the Q&A window anytime during this presentation uh, we have with us today. My name is Chris Ferrichidis. I'm the chair of the electrical engineering department. So uh, one more time, thanks for joining us. We have with us today Professor um, Wiesal, Ishmael Wiesal, who is our undergraduate director. Uh, I don't know what if they are seeing everybody. Can they see the others or not? No, they can only see you. OK, so you'll see Dr. Wiesal later. We also have Dr. Hoff, Andrew Hoff, who is the graduate program director. We have um, Gabriela Franco, Gabby Franco, who uh, has been talking. You heard her speak before. And she is, she is the boss of, boss of everybody. She's handling the meeting today. She's telling us what to do. And we have uh, Miss Diana Hamilton, who is um, handling the graduate program. And um, that's probably the best person to contact if you have questions about our program. So uh, let me just get started. Uh, Gabby, can we go to the next? Um, so I I mentioned all these five people. Uh, Diana is on the top left, Gabby top right. Uh, the two most important ones here, Dr. Hov, Wiesal and myself. So we're all here. If you have any questions, we'll, we'll uh, try to answer them. Um, next slide. So why would uh, why would you join our, um, our graduate program here? We are assuming today that most of you are interested in the Masters of Science uh, in EE. If you have interest in PhD, we can address questions on that topic also. Uh, but most of what we have to share is uh, is really geared towards um, those interested in pursuing a master's degree. Um, First reason is we do have work class faculty and we're not saying that just uh, for as, as a figure of speech. Uh, all of our faculty are known internationally for their research work in their respective fields. Uh, we also have a very flexible program. At the master's level, you start specializing. So you're looking at gaining depth in, in some uh, sub areas on that that are of interest to you. But our program also allows you to address breadth. So every area allows you to uh, pursue technical electives to supplement your core concentration. You can choose to take your master's and complete it by doing coursework only. You can choose to do a, a thesis option that involves doing research. Or you can choose what we call practice, uh, where you do internships and um, they count for credit. Um, next, next slide, Gabby. So the biggest reason to join us is is our students. Okay, we are very proud of our students. Um, they all uh, have a top of the line work ethic. They are high achievers, and as you can see in this uh, photograph, this is Dr. Hoff's favorite picture. Uh, they also know how to have some fun, and they also know how to hire cooks for their events. For this particular event, uh, Professor Jong and myself were barbecuing. You cannot see us because we're hiding. But um, if you if you do decide to join us, uh, you're going to enjoy some good uh, food and some fun out in the park here next to the university. Next slide, Gabby. I just wanted to at least introduce you in 30 seconds or less to the 30 faculty we have in the department. If um, you can find out about each one of our uh, research areas on our website, then we're not going to go into that much detail right now. But once you figure out uh, your interests, you can contact us directly with any specific questions. Next slide. So some numbers about the department. I already mentioned we have 30 faculty and we do have three staff that are helping us run the department. 
we have approximately 300 undergraduate students. These are juniors and seniors. And as you can see, we have about 250, 260 graduate students, 150 of whom are pursuing a master's degree and about 110 are pursuing a PhD degree. We have a very well balanced program, almost 50-50 between the undergraduate and graduate um, popul student population. And we have a very strong research program. 110 PhD students is, um, we have the largest PhD program in the college. And um, if you were attending the earlier session with um, Ms. Eva Fernandez, she talked about patents and citations and research. We are leading the college in patents and citation, and I believe we're in the top two in terms of research expenditures. As you can see, our funding comes from national, um, uh, sorry, federal agencies like the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, National Institute of Health, and so forth. And there is many opportunities for our students to join research projects and participate. Um, next slide. So here is a busy slide. Um, these are the areas of concentration that you can choose to focus on as a master's student. And I'm gonna start at 12 o'clock and go around there clockwise. Uh, we have an area of concentration we recently added in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And Dr. Wiesel, who is here with us today, he is the advisor for that area. The wireless area, which is also a very popular and we get calls all the time uh, for new graduates to be employed in the local industry, is led by Dr. Jin Wan. Controls and robotics by Dr. Wilfredo Moreno. Nano and microelectronics, Dr. Don Morel. Communications, which is yet another hot area, uh, is led by Dr. Ravi Sankar. Biomedical and bioelectrical systems, DJ Jane. Uh, we also have systems and security. If you recall during the previous session, somebody asked uh, Eva uh, about a Master's of Science in Cybersecurity. Our department is actually working in offering one in collaboration with computer science. The program does not exist as a Master's of Science in Cybersecurity, but you can get a Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering with security focus, okay? Uh, we have energy and power and sustainability, or the last one on the top left, and the um, advisor for that is Dr. Miao. So we just wanted to put the names of these folks for you there, just to see if, uh, if you find the area of interest to you, so you can have a name and an email to contact them. Next slide. Um, so Drew, if you want to get ready, I can do this slide and then I can pass it on to you so you can, you can get to talk also. Um, admission requirements. Uh, since we handpicked the invitees for this session, um, you are meeting the first one. You are graduating uh, or you have graduated from an ABIT accredited program. Um, I'm pretty sure they selected uh, students uh, with GPS above 3.0, so you should meet that requirement. The English proficiency is for international students, and if you completed your degree at a Florida institution, uh, you don't need that. So what we will need for uh, to process your application is your transcripts, three letters of recommendation, that's item five, a very brief personal statement on your interests, your resume, item seven, and item eight is only for PhD students. So if either, uh, if any of you attending uh, are interested in a PhD, we do require GRE scores. We do not require them though for master students. And I'm going to pass it on to Dr. Hoff so he can speak and also be seen also. So, you can switch us if you don't mind, Gabby. For sure. I just need Dr. Hoff to turn on his com his camera. All right, Drew, you're up. There you go. OK, well, welcome again, everybody. Gabby, could you go back one slide? Yes, sir. 
worst laid plans. Uh, one one uh, uh, misprint on item four oh. here. Official transcripts are only required if you're once you're admitted. Uh, to have your package reviewed, you can submit unofficial transcripts with your uh, with your application packet. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, many of you might be interested in in uh, working for the department because I. If you uh, have 10 hours of employment with the department, uh, you receive a tuition waiver, which cuts your bill a lot. It doesn't cut the uh, fees, but it cuts all the tuition. So anyway, in order to get such an assignment, you really need to reach out to faculty teaching courses you have a strength in. So if you're really strong in power applications, for example, then you'd want to go talk with the professors that teach uh, reasonably sized power courses here. Uh, if your interest is uh, wireless, then you need to go speak with the professors that are working in microwave and RF. Um, or if you if you've perhaps worked as an undergraduate research uh, student at your home institution that you're graduating from, uh, maybe research is your interest and in that you need to identify for uh, faculty that uh, either have research interests in, in a strength you've already performed in or faculty uh, who have research interests in your own specific research areas of, of uh, expertise. Um, we have some PhD fellowships that are that are available to students uh, who also have research RA positions in the department. So. Um, sometimes these can these things can be arranged before you enter if you're in a PhD applicant uh, or once you're a master's student, for example, get to know your professors, get to know the, the, the professors who teach in, in areas that you're particularly strong in and perhaps you can uh, get a teaching assistantship. Next slide, please. So something to do early on is to figure out what you're going to do. Are you going to do research? Are you going to, so are you going to do a non-thesis? Um, if you're doing research, you're in the thesis option. If you're doing not, if you're not going to be doing research, then you're in the non-thesis option. And you need to uh, work out a program. You can follow some of these links, for example, but the sooner you work out a program of what you're going to take and when you're going to take it and publish it with the department, uh, the sooner you can, you know, rest assured that all your ducks are in a row, so to speak. Next slide, please. So if you're depending on what track you're interested in following, as Dr. Farrakis mentioned, all the all the tracks, including the new ones, um, if you're not in any one of those tracks and you want to specialize, then you're in the general track and the general track is one that I supervise. But anyway, there's uh, all of the tracks have the same basic requirements. You need to complete two core math courses and one track math course. You need to complete four core courses. And if you're in the general track, then you you pick and choose from core courses uh, associated with the multiple tracks you're following, for example. If you're in the thesis option, then you need to uh, work out how many hours of, of tech electives you're going to have, uh, because you can have six to nine credit hours of thesis uh, while you're doing your research. If you're in the non-thesis option, then you add to the 18 core credits we're talking about here, uh, you need to add another 12 credits of just coursework. And those come from the electives indicated. So each of the each of the master's tracks has these concentration areas has has all these listings as similar to what you see on the right hand side of the screen here. And that's really the courses you pick and choose from. Now, every track has one of these sheets. So if you're in the general track, then you just 
you know, pick and choose from the gener from each track individually. And you can contact me if you have questions about that. Next slide, please. So let's look at a non-thesis MSEE plan. Uh, semester one, you would, for example, you could take all of your math and get out of that out of the way. That's three, that's six credit hours of math. So it's, um, it's uh, three individual courses. Then um, you would just take one of your concentration core requirements. The following semester, you take uh, your remaining core requirements. So by the end of the first two semesters, you've finished all of your basic requirements for the comprehensive exam, which happens in the third semester. Um, every student that graduates with a master's degree from USF, regardless of department, has to take a comprehensive exam. And for the non-thesis, that's an exam that's derived from the courses we're talking about in these first two semesters of work here. Um, so during semester three, you take three electives and one of those electives has to be um, associated with your comprehensive exam. And then by semester four, you only have one more elective you need to take and then you graduate. Now, in addition to that, you don't have to take all electives. You can take up to six credit hours of independent study or you can take uh, some courses outside the department with prior departmental approval. You can do internships, credits, et cetera. So uh, some combination of all those three uh, things happens in that six credits. Next slide, please. The only thing that's different between the thesis plan and the and the uh, prior non-thesis plan is that you're doing research. So, and you're writing and defending a thesis. So the, the published thesis and the defense of that thesis constitute your comprehensive exam, just as the, the six core, the, um, the core courses that I talked about in the in the earlier slide constitute the comprehensive exam for the non-thesis option. But that's really the only difference. The, you still have the same core requirements, the three courses in math, um, the four courses in the concentration cores, and then you can take an elective, for example. So the difference there is that if you're doing a non-thesis, you need to take 24 credits of coursework uh, minimum for your degree. If you're a thesis student, you can take as little as 21 credits of coursework and up to nine credit hours of, of thesis research. Next slide, please. So it's many of our students come in as a master student. In fact, historically students do that. I was one myself. I entered in my graduate training as a master student thinking I'd leave in a couple of years. I ended up getting a PhD, uh, but uh, so a lot of students do that. If you want to do that from an MS, you have to submit another application to the uh, graduate school. Um, you have to provide a new statement of purpose, an updated resume, but presumably when, you, when you've been here as a master's student, you spent the time and gotten to know faculty and figured out who would, who would be your advisor for your PhD program. So you put that person that's that's agreed to be your advisor in your statement of purpose. You know, Joe Blivett, PhD, is, has agreed to be my advisor. Um, you update your resume and different from the masters, uh, you need GRE scores for your um, for your PhD application. For the masters, we don't require GRE. Um, you do not need to resubmit transcripts, test scores, or any letters of recommendation for that. Next slide, please. So the, the final answer 
to any question that anybody has about their graduate program is typically referred to the graduate catalog. If anybody in a department or whatever has, I mean, everybody in the departments has to follow what's in the graduate catalog. If something's in the graduate catalog, no matter what I think, that's going to be the final say in the matter. Uh, so for complete graduate study policies and requirements, it's always best to refer to the online catalog. Next slide. So I think we'll switch over to Professor Lusall. Yeah, so this next uh, can you you can we can still be here, correct? Yes. Yeah. This OK, this next section, uh, guys, is for our attendees. We are trying to give you a flavor of some of the research that's ongoing in the department. And uh, what we plan to do, we have a follow up to this meeting in two weeks on February 3rd at 3 p.m. There is a slide where you see the time for that. And in that one, we are going to ask um, several faculty to join that and, and give us additional in-depth descriptions, if you will, of what goes on under uh, the concentrations that you see here in front of you, but also give you a little more uh, detail about the research. This is just a quick overview that we are going to try to share with you today and Dr. Rizal is going to kick it off. So thank you, Ishmael. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome again. Um, so in my so, so my name is Ismail Usal. I'm the undergraduate program director at the department. Um, and uh, in my you know personal opinion, I think research is important for um, basically um, any university program, including the undergraduate program, but even more so for the graduate programs, right? So uh, like Dr. Ferkidi said in the next, uh, you know, I guess a couple of dozen slides, uh, we want to, you know, go over some of the exciting stuff that's going on in the department at the graduate level uh, research side. So um, this uh, particular um, track, artificial intelligence and machine learning, I would say it's it's brand new. Um, so we very recently uh, started this, uh, you know, uh, this track in our graduate program. Uh, and just like the name implies, it actually uh, encompasses a large area of, of topics um, that has a lot to do with data. So um, the, the faculty who are involved in, in this track, um, who teaches courses in this track and who does research in this track, uh, do a wide variety of things, including um, robotics and AI. This is the more traditional sense of AI, um, how to use AI and machine learning in cyber physical systems. This is both to improve efficiency and also uh, uh, security. Um, a lot of data analytics, including big data, um, uh, statistical inference, as in what we can infer from the data by applying these sophisticated uh, learning algorithms uh, for predictive tasks, for example. Um, and deep learning, which is a very popular term. Um, and um, several years ago, we, you know, we started a course in deep learning uh, where we use the advanced, um, you know, hardware that's available to us now that was not available, say, uh, 10 years ago, along with the immense amounts of data and basically tie them together to come up with, uh, you know, these uh, exciting solutions from anywhere from healthcare to smart cities to smart agriculture to, um, you know, uh, to intelligent brain machine interfaces. So uh, we can go to the next slide, Gabby. So just a couple of slides to give you a flavor of some of the work that our faculty does, especially those who teach uh, in this area, AI and, and, and machine learning. Um, I am one of them. Um, so um, I try uh, to group some of the work that I do under this general term that I call uh, machine intelligence for sensor applications. Uh, I call it machine intelligence because I try to train uh, learning algorithms to extract uh, actionable data or information from some of the data that's out there that we collect from different sensors. Now this slide looks crowded, so I'm going to try to walk you through this uh, in, in, a, in a short period of time, hopefully. Um, but I want, in the end, I want you to see that uh, there is an underlying 
you know, framework to all of this uh, that is pretty much the same. Um, so on the bottom, where you see these two images uh, with this green borders, uh, is a project that we uh, we have been working on for a while now, where we try to come up with intelligent brain machine interfaces so you can control a computer using only your brain waves. Uh, this is specifically for people who may be disabled, uh, who may not be able to use their, their arms or fingers, uh, but also for uh, other kinds of applications, like military applications, for example, where you want to be able to control um, a computer interface uh, using just your brain. Um, so the idea is to collect uh, sensor data, which is the, your brain waves using uh, these devices that we call EEG uh, devices, and then use this data, process this data, to see if we can come up with algorithms that can learn uh, if you are looking at a certain area of the screen, for example, or if you're thinking of a particular command that you, you would like to convey to the computer. Um, in the second project that's listed here, that's on the top right in with the pink borders, uh, again, the idea is very similar, but a completely different application. So now we look at if we can monitor, um, you know, human activity in falls using these wristband sensors. If you have a smartwatch, if you have a smartphone, and I don't think there is anyone who lives, uh, you know, in, in today's day and age without some kind of a smart device that's within six feet of them, right? Um, so these devices include these simple chips called accelerometers that can measure the acceleration of these devices. So what we did in this project is to collect that accelerometer sensor data and try to see if a patient has fallen in a healthcare facility, for example, and to detect that even before uh, you know, someone maybe uh, hears a cry for help, or uh, or maybe when you know, if it when it's too late, we would like to make sure that the the personnel who works at the facility gets any you know a direct alarm when someone falls uh, wearing these wristband sensors. We can also take it one step further and then do some kind of activity detection so that people uh, we can tell if people have been following a specific exercise regimen properly. Uh, or physical therapy properly using sensor data. Just like the first project, there are sensors, co we collect the data and we apply sophisticated algorithms to extract actionable information from the data. The last two pro projects, once again, are similar in that way. So these are on the smart agriculture side. These are projects with that are funded by the US Department of Agriculture, where we look at how we can improve food production using uh, smart sensors. In the first project, we looked at how we can uh, embed the sensors in the soil so we can have real-time monitoring of the harvest situations for the most sustainable and the highest quality harvest. And in the fourth project, we take these strawberries, in, in this case, uh, the, the, the product we work with is strawberry because we live in Florida and strawberry is one of the most critical elements of Florida agriculture. Then we take these strawberries and see if we can come up with smart logistics where we monitor temperature, humidity, along the transportation lines and then come up with these, uh, you know, uh, distribution uh, algorithms to yield with the least amount of waste and the highest amount of quality for the consumers. And again, the basic idea is once again the same. We use sensors to collect data and then we uh, work with the data to extract actionable information. Uh, Gabby, we can go to the next slide. And I'm sorry if I spent too much time on that slide, but uh, you know, uh, that's the work that I do. So if you're obviously if you're interested in uh, applications of AI and machine learning in, in many different areas, please feel free to contact me anytime. Uh, Dr. Chen is one of our faculty who also works in that field. He has done uh, he, uh, he's done some excellent work over the you know past several years on how we can bring AI into controlling robotics. Uh, more specifically, we were talking about distributed robotics. So. Uh, one of the applications that uh, you know he's been focusing on is Smart Factory, where you have this huge collection of data in the cloud, and through running these uh, different algorithms from market analytics to efficient production to uh, fault detection, uh, basically they try to control uh, this multi-robot systems in huge factories that would result in not only increased production, but also increased safety for humans who work in the same factory. Uh, this includes, uh, you know, wireless networking algorithms. This includes AI algorithms that run on the data. This includes cyber physical interaction of not a single agent, but multi-agent systems. Like I said, there are many robots, as you can imagine, in today's factories. Uh, we, we do a lot of sensing 
um, as well, where we collect the sensor data to aid in our decision making. And like I said, the keyword here is distributed, right? So we look at not a single agent or a single robot, but we look at how they can work effectively together. And there is a natural extension to that where he does a lot of work in how to apply machine learning to improve efficiency of wireless network systems as well. We can go to the next slide, Gabby. Um, Chris, if you want, I can say a few words about this track as well. Uh, the RF micro. Uh, you can keep going until, yeah, you're going to hit my area soon. I'm going to do my slide for sure and we'll keep going. Keep going. Okay, sounds good. So, so I talked about one of our tracks, one of our graduate tracks, AI and machine learning. So another track that we have in the department with a lot longer history is the, the wireless track, the, uh, specifically uh, you know, the track that deals with uh, RF design, RF and microwave circuits, antenna design, antenna theory, uh, how to design wireless networks, both on the hardware side and the software side, how to do effective RF and microwave measurements, um, and we have a, a lab we call the VAMI lab, Wireless Circuits and Systems Lab, uh, that is pretty famous because um, uh, you know they provide uh, literally world-class education when it comes to uh, you know how to become experts in using uh, RF and microwave hardware to do measurements, to do design, and all those things. If you go to the next slide, Gabby. Um, uh, like I said, we call. Um, Sometimes we call this track the VAMI track. Uh, it's basically the Center for Wireless and Microwave Information Systems. And I am an ad hoc member uh, of this group as well with some of the works that I do on the sensor side and, and, and the sensor network side. Um, but basically uh, this group, um, you know, which includes Dr. Mumju, Dr. Wang, Dr. Dan Levy, uh, uh, our um, you know, uh, research uh, professor, Dr. Kandelval, um, the, the main work that they do is in using uh, advanced uh, methods, This in, by methods I mean uh, advanced materials, uh, different kinds of processing techniques, different kinds of measurement techniques to come up with, um, you know, different antenna designs um, that can work up to very extremely high frequencies like 170 gigahertz um, and um, some of the uh, things that uh, have been done in, in that area is, for example, microfluidic antenna design, where you can change uh, on the spot the uh, the characteristics of the antenna uh, by applying, uh, you know, uh, a different you know kinds of input uh, to these antennas, so that you know you can you can change its characteristics on the go, uh, which is um, um, you know which is pretty difficult to do if you use a static antenna design. Um, the sponsors uh, of uh, the VAMI lab includes the, the Air Force, the Army Research Office, National Science Foundation, and a huge support also comes from industry people. That This includes Corvo, CMC, Monolithics, and the idea is again to come up with these novel designs, not just for antennas, but also for, you know, IC design and also measurement equipment as well, um, so that we can come up with um, you know, better scalability and better performance uh, when it comes to RF and microwave uh, design. And um, there, are, uh, there is also um, the course that's being offered on the, under this track is uh, sponsored by NSF. Um, uh, some of the work that Dr. Mamja does as part of his research, he actually brings enhanced visualization, um, you know, techniques to his class where you can uh, actually use virtual reality uh, to to look at how you know uh, wireless devices um, you know operate um, you know uh, in a medium. So uh, this is a world class uh, track that we're very proud of, and some of our most successful graduates actually um, you know graduate uh, you know from this track. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Gabby. I, uh, okay, so micro and electronics. I guess Chris, this is when we get back to you, right? I think, yeah, I can, I think I only have one slide there for my, go ahead, Gabby, let's, let's grab the next one. Oh, before we, before we go, uh, just, just, uh, let, let, let's back up, let's back up. So, um, in case you haven't noticed, uh, we listed the topics around the, the big circle there. So, in terms of the type of topics you expect to take under this uh, particular track, you can see integrated circuit technology. There is actually a couple of courses taught 
um, under that and uh, Dr. Hoff, who is on the call today, he's the instructor for those. And if you have any specific questions, throw them his way. We also teach courses like uh, System on a Chip, Analog CMOS VLSI. We have some uh, unique uh, experiences in flexible electronics and thin film solar cells based on the expertise of our researchers. And some of the most fu more fundamental type of uh, topics like semiconductor device theory, if that's something that uh, you, you want to gain a strength in. So le let's go to the next uh, slide, uh, Gabby. Uh, in terms of research uh, in this particular area, I know um, you expect something uh, maybe more in the CMOS VLSI area. I just wanted to um, expand your view of this particular nanoelectronics or microelectronics uh, concentration, if you will. Uh, the general area of electronic materials actually falls under that particular subject and um, I'm one of the faculty in this department that does research in the materials area and my focus is uh, thin film photovoltaics. We have been uh, doing this for almost over 30 years now and uh, you heard manufacturing come up several times. Part of our objectives, um, at least one of our objectives over the years have been to improve the devices but also improve um, the manufacturing in terms of lowering the cost. So we were sponsored and we continue to be sponsored by the Department of Energy to investigate a family uh, of materials uh, for uh, and develop more manufacturable processes, if you will, to lower the cost of the technologies, but also make more efficient solar cells by improving the properties of the materials as well as improving the devices and the devices, those of you that have training in semiconductors, solar cells are simply PN junctions, but they are complicated PN junctions. Is They're not necessarily trivial, especially the type of devices we built in our labs. They are hetero junctions based on uh, four or five layers of different materials. Our activities include uh, everything from uh, fabricating these things, making films, making film stacks, converting them into devices, all the way to characterizing them and then modeling their behavior. Um, next slide, Gabby. What's, uh, oh, communications. I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw it back at Ishmael. I think this is more in his. Uh... So, um, hello again, everyone. So, <laughs> Uh, so the communication networking and signal processing track, um, uh, this is a track that we co-advise with Dr. Ravi uh, Sankar and um, this track actually includes um, or used to include, let's say, uh, data related uh, topics as well, including machine learning. And uh, once it got to a certain stage, we decided it probably made more sense to, to have its own track. But still, we do a lot of signal processing work in this track. Uh, signal processing includes both biomedical signal processing uh, as well as as well as speech signal processing. There are a lot of commonalities with the AI and machine learning track as well. But on the communication side, we do a lot of work in broadband communications, uh, 5G, uh, as you all I'm sure are, are familiar with now that we're uh, converting all our you know cellular communications to 5G, um, digital communication systems, wireless sensor networks. Again, some of the work that I do kind of falls in that area. Uh, wireless communications, both on the hardware side as well as on the software side, things like channel modeling, efficient communication, effective communications, um, and DSP, like I said, uh, both biomedical and speech. Um, also, mobile and personal communication, which includes basically a lot of the protocols and algorithms that go into your personal communication devices, such as your smartphone. Um, if we go into the next slide, Gabby. So um, this wireless communication processing group is uh, headed by Dr. Uh, Arslan, uh, who has done a lot of work in the development of 5G uh, throughout the years. So he's one of the contributors uh, or let's say significant contributors to that, to the development of, the of that technology. Um, he works on both, like I said, on the hardware side and on the, the software side. Uh, he, he does a lot of work on the physical layer side. This includes coming up with um, you know, uh, new signal processing techniques so that you can have a more efficient channel, for example, in improving the waveform characteristics, which means you use less bandwidth 
for more effective communications. Uh, in order to achieve that, he's uh, he's done a lot of work, like I said, on waveform design specifically for 5G. Uh, so if you want to work on the, I would say, the cutting edge of uh, the next generation of communications, uh, you know, uh, you'll come to the right place if you choose uh, USFWE for your master's or, or for your graduate program. Um, also, multiple access schemes. Um, this includes, like I said, um, you know, a lot of work on um, uh, radio access um, techniques as well as on, um, you know, both on the hardware side and the software side. Um, also, um, some of the work that they did uh, is, um, uh, you know, how we can, uh, you know, shape some of these waveforms, like like the, you know the pulse, um, you know the pulse shape, where we design specific filters, and this falls on the signal processing side, um, specific filters, so we can have reduced bandwidth while improving the communication rate, uh, and thus resulting in more e efficient communications. Uh, in this case, efficiency stems from basically the fact that you use less of a channel to convey more information. If you have taken some of these communication courses in your undergraduate, uh, maybe you know some of the things that I'm, I'm talking about, but uh, there is a lot of uh, what I would call magic uh, that goes into, uh, that, into that design where you send out uh, an information uh, by compressing it to an extent where it almost looks like it would be impossible to recover but you still do that even when in the presence of noise, uh, but if you come up with a smart uh, pulse shaping filter design. Um, so if you can go to the next uh, page, Gabby. Uh, here is another uh, research group uh, we call ICONS. It stands for Interdisciplinary Communications, Networking and Signal Processing Lab. This is uh, the lab uh, by one of our uh, co-advisors, Dr. Sankar, Ravi Sankar. Um, and some of the work that he does, um, you know, again, uh, kind of rests at the intersection of, uh, you know, uh, using communication technologies to collect the data and then come up with advanced signal processing techniques to do something with the data. Um, uh, here you can see three of his projects listed. Uh, one of them, uh, similar to some of the work that I do on, you know, fall detection and, and activity recognition, uh, they use variable technologies to collect uh, information, uh, more specifically to identify, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, at the onset of some of these neurodegenerative diseases like the, uh, the Parkinson disease, for example. Um, and the idea is to collect, uh, you know, signal data or sensor data from, from multiple points along the body, and this includes uh, anywhere from motion data, like walking to speech data, so that uh, one can analyze these uh, signals and then determine uh, if that person has uh, some onset signs of neurodegenerative diseases. And although there's been a lot of talk on things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, it is still extremely difficult to come up with a definitive diagnosis of some of these diseases. So he's working on, 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 on that side. There is also uh, looking at uh, things at, you know, like a blood flow sound to see if we can use that, the blood flow sound, and map it to some of the other measurements you can take, including, you know, heart rate, respiration rate. And the reason why we do this is because that way we can come up with cheaper devices that accomplish the monitoring capabilities of more expensive de uh, devices so that we can expand access to healthcare basically all over the world. Um, on the communication side, again, uh, a lot of wireless sensor networking work goes on uh, in our department. Um, as you are probably aware, uh, Florida is one of those states where we deal with extreme weather uh, every once in a while, right? Um, so um, in order to uh, detect maybe the onset of extreme weather by some of the more simpler measurements like air quality prediction, for example, um, or, or air quality sensors, and then try to integrate both the physical measurements that come from these sensors as well as the, uh, the social measure, uh, measurements uh, to see if we can improve some of the, both the prediction and the recovery of these extreme weather scenarios that happen um, in, uh, you know, around the world. And uh, one of the things Dr. Friakidis mentioned uh, about our faculty, he said that our faculty is known worldwide. This also includes the fact that, of course, we work with other faculty around the globe. 
um, we have a lot of our uh, research faculty with uh, active research partners in many diff different areas around the world, and you can see some of them here uh, for the ICONS lab. Gabby, can, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, biomedical systems, I, Dr. Hoff, uh, I don't know if we're going to be back to you on this one. Oh, oh yes, let's see. speak to them. Hello? Yeah, go ahead, Drew. Do we have any slides in that area? Yeah, I think one or two. Okay. Yep. Okay, well, um, more more uh, non-invasive measurements that uh, that relate to uh, health care. Um, Dr. Parthasarathy has um, a laboratory and a research program that's focused on using infrared to um, to image regions of the brain. Um, you don't normally think of of uh, the skull is being transparent, but it is at those wavelengths. So uh, using that, he can he can uh, map out densities of uh, of uh, material. And if there's he's what he's looking for is stroke. So if you have a if you have a uh, an event where where you uh, have a small blood bleed, excuse me, it's a tongue twister, blood bleed. Uh, in your brain, uh, that's that constitutes a stroke, and uh, they can be very hazardous. Now, if 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 you could put a cap on uh, in the emergency room and measure that, uh, you could be treated much faster and and have much uh, more opportunity for success and resolution of it, rather than it, you know, basically killing you or or disabling you long range. So he's focusing on on uh, the sensitivity and how to um, better <clears throat> better predict stroke. Uh, so before bleeds happen, you know what what's a what's a sign of of, uh, of this and he, he does it from outside the skull using infrared signals. Next slide. I just want to add here that I think Dr. Pratasarathy has built a prototype and I believe they are testing it as we speak at Tampa General. Can can you confirm, Drew, or I Ismail? Confirm, Do you know that? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I, I think I think he's doing that. So okay, we have the bioengineering lab, which is uh, which is uh, Dr. Morgera. Does Dr. Morgera also run this military defense lab? I believe so, yes. I'm not aware of that activity, but I guess because of its secure nature. Um, anyway, he uh, he does a lot of things with uh, optics and uh, neuroengineering, computational biology. Um, <clears throat> he uh, for many years was a professor down in Miami in that area uh, and uh, came here in 2011 or 2010 uh, to work in our department as a department chair and then he uh, he's also maintained this fairly extensive research collaboration around the world so he's another one of those those faculty but he's not only working in bio bioengineering but he's also working on CubeSat systems and communications. Um, his industrial experience uh, was from uh, one of the one of the Bell spinoffs from the um, <clears throat> 1980s um, where he was responsible for a lot of uh, communications technology research. Anyway, and then and then he also has this uh, military defense lab. We have uh, uh, programs with uh, U.S. SOCOM and Department of Defense, and he's he's working on a variety of things there that uh, relate to communications, to security, to uh, uh, various aspects of networking, 5G cellular networks for secure communications, etc. So. 
is uh, just a quick just a quick note to to add to Dr. Morgera's project list there. Um, they recently got funding to develop the bull nose, right? Um, basically, an artificial nose to sniff uh, COVID. So, right. Right. Thank you. I. Had, uh, we should have added it to the. Say story. anything about that? There are a number of programs in the department that are related to the, the COVID uh, um, detection and and remediation. You don't have anything about, I guess, I guess we, uh, in my, in my activities, I work in um, uh, using electric fields generated by surface deposited charge to deliver drugs and DNA to skin cells. Most, most electrical engineers don't know it, but if you, if you pulse fields uh, in the vicinity of a, of a tissue cell and you have some DNA in that in that uh, area, the DNA gets taken up by the cell by endocytosis, transported to the nucleus, and a couple days later the cell starts making whatever the DNA snippet or plasmid codes for. So it's it's a process that has significant potential for uh, protein therapies, and uh, it's it's been used uh, with direct pulsing using using electrodes to mitigate uh, uh, metastatic cancer for melanoma. So it's a uh, it's a pretty exciting area, and something that, that most electrical engineers don't don't think about. But as Dr. Ferakides has mentioned, there are a lot of uh, crossover activities that are happening between biomed and uh, our electrical engineering department. And that's all I have, I think. What's uh, what's next? Oh, security. Um, let's see, who's, who's slides? I, I think I can say a few words on this one too, Chris. Yeah, if you, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, go ahead. Take cybersecurity. I think you know the yeah. So um, cybersecurity. Um, if you could go back one slide, Gabby. Uh, just a few words here on this slide, and now we can move on. Um, so I believe there was a question on that, um, and Dr. Freaky just briefly touched on it too at at the beginning. But um, uh, this was uh, several years ago. I can't remember exactly how many because uh, time flies pretty fast. But um, uh, we, uh, there were a lot of uh, new faculty who came into the department specifically or with specific expertise, let's say, in cyber uh, physical systems and cyber security. So we have a very strong, uh, you know, a group of faculty who both do research in this area and teach uh, really cool courses. Some of these courses are listed here, cryptography and data security. Uh, data network systems and security, data analytics and advanced data analytics, statistical inference, advanced cybersecurity, and network science. They all address some of the challenges we have in designing safe and secure cyber physical systems. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Gabby. Uh, one of our faculty, Dr. Morris Chang, um, so his lab is called the Data Driven Intelligence and Cybersecurity Lab. And one of the things he, he works on is actually uh, somewhat of an uh, interest uh, of mine as well, how we can preserve the privacy in the era of big data. As you all know, this actually has been a very hotly debated topic over the last, I would say, several years on how some of these uh, social media companies handle data uh, and how they process the data to come up with uh, some you know, unique recommendations for you, for example. But at the same time, how much of a privacy issue this constitutes. So a lot of research and a lot of excitement going on in the area of uh, privacy preserving machine learning algorithms. So what, what, what this means is basically you want these systems systems such as you know Facebook or uh, or Netflix, for example, when it recommends you a movie, uh, to still be able to do an accurate job, right? So to be able to recommend you with things that you're really interested to read about or to watch about while preserving your privacy. So uh, some of the work that Dr. Chang does is, is on that front. So how can we come up with these 
systems where if someone listens in to the communication or to to the data that's uh, you know uh, that's going back and forth um, and if they have access to the specific um, algorithm that's used to process this data some of the damage they can do is actually pretty um, you know pretty significant and this becomes even more important in uh, defense applications as well so how can we come up with a method where we can train these algorithms but somehow preserve both the the, the safety of the algorithm where a, a um, for example someone listening in will not be able to quickly identify what the algorithm does and also the privacy of the users uh, or, or the, the, the security of the users who use this data platform and the algorithm. So uh, he's sponsored by the defense agency DARPA and he's done a lot of good work in that area. Um, and some of the technologies that he works on actually is being used in some, you know, um, um, in uh, the technologies that we use every day. So, um, and it's like I said, a big, a big uh, challenge for us um, as data scientists, but also a great application area. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Gabby. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Yilmaz is one of our faculty, again, who works in this area. His uh, lab is called the SIS lab, Security Intelligence Systems Lab. And he's a data scientist. Uh, he does a lot of work with how we can you know, work with big data, how we can do analytics on this, how we can do data fusion. Uh, by data fusion, what I mean is uh, assume that you have all these heterogeneous data sources. Uh, for example, some data coming in from, from cameras, for example, some data coming in from, uh, you know, uh, from voice sensors, from microphones, audio data, visual data, pictures, text, all of this data, let's say describing an event, how can we combine and fuse this data together to get to get more information about the event that they are trying to capture? Uh, in fact, um, you know, him, uh, myself, and and two of our students recently was awarded, uh, uh, you know, by uh, a comp uh, we won a competition by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in how we can fuse some of the uh, some of this uh, heterogeneous data that's coming from multiple sources to have real-time detection of anomaly, anomalous events uh, that takes place at a certain venue, for example. Um, he's done a, lot, done a lot of work in machine learning, uh, statistical signal processing. Again, uh, security is, is a big um, a research area for uh, the SIS lab. Some of the recent work he's done is on uh, mo modeling sea level rise and how can we use that to predict and address climate change, which is uh, definitely critical for uh, uh, states like Florida with a lot of coastline, right? Uh, he's sponsored by National Science Foundation and uh, SCEEE. Uh, and uh, again, it, this is not only on the sensor side, but also on the communication side. How can we come up with the efficient resource allocation algorithms so we can distribute resources? Um, this is more important uh, for the latest uh, platform, which is 5G communications, because now you have these base stations which um, can, uh, you know, uh, beam data to a, a, a higher resolution uh, map. And so it becomes very important to be able to pool your resources and basically address the areas where uh, more bandwidth, more communication uh, resources are needed. So he's done a lot of work on that front. Um, as well as, like I said, using these uh, smart machine learning algorithms and data fusion to come up with uh, intelligent, um, you know, transportation systems, um, you know, environmental impact modeling, as in the sea level rise, and things that have an impact on our everyday lives, basically. Uh, we can go to the next slide, Gabby. Uh, so re renewable energy and power systems, I guess I pass the ball back to Dr. Ferakidis. Yeah, last but not least, um, uh, power and energy. We have uh, significant strengths in this area. As a matter of fact, we have the so-called Energy Research Center that originated in, in the electrical engineering department. You can see some of the general topics that you can expect to pursue in, in this particular concentration, like power electronics. Uh, you can see power system protection, design of solar power plants, 
power analysis and so on. And we do have significant uh, research in this area. Uh, if we can go to the next slide, please, Gabby. Uh, smart grid, I, I, in, in case you haven't uh, heard the term uh, smart grid, um, I, I like to refer to it. It's the modern grid, right? In uh, maybe 20 years ago when our only generation uh, sort of plants were either coal burning or gas burning plants, uh, the, the world was kind of simple. We had this huge generation. Uh, you had a distribution system and then you had the end user at, at the other end, whether it was a home or a business. As we added to our um, diversity of sources, if you will, nowadays we have renewable sources like wind and solar and hydro. I forgot to mention nuclear, which is still there, um, including nowadays we also have storage on the grid. There is a, a huge diversity of sources that provide this power and they are in several cases intermittent, right? The wind blows more at night, so wind tends to turn on at night. The output of wind plants are higher at night. Of course, solar plants, uh, they have, um, they only, they, the sun only shines during the day and, and in that it's also variable depending on cloud coverage and weather conditions that prevail in a particular area. So the the power system has gotten more complicated, so it requires a lot more controls and monitoring. You keep, you keep hearing the term sensors coming up, but these folks are also sensing uh, anything from weather conditions to demand to supply and availability of power, and they have to put extra controls on the grid. They're turning it into literally a smart grid in order to manage all the generation while meeting all the demand at the end user and they want to do it um, cost effectively. We have our top uh, researchers in this area. They are funded by the Department of Energy and as you can see um, on the left hand side, the renewable energy grid integration. Uh, they have a project that addresses how to optimize the integration of wind and solar uh, into the grid. And they also do some work with uh, local industry like uh, Duke and Florida Power. Uh, they even work with Jable. And uh, since the grid has gotten more complicated and, is, and, and um, uh, more, uh, if you will, uh, of a cyber physical system, it's, it's easily, uh, it can be easily hacked nowadays. It's connected to uh, with, with everything else that we have in our world and uh, there are security issues. So they also deal with security when it comes to the power grid. Um, next uh, slide, uh, Gabby. I think this is the last one. Yeah, so I mentioned briefly, the, I'll, I'll give you a quick review of the, uh, of the Clean Energy Research Center. This is a center um, uh, that resides in the Department of Electrical Engineering and it's uh, headed by one of our faculty members with a co-director from uh, Chemical Engineering. And they work on topics that vary from storage. Uh, you can see high temperature thermal energy storage on the top left to supercapacitors for, for similar applications. They also work with solar thermal. We have a large uh, solar thermal plant right across from the office where I'm sitting now. And another uh, area that if you can see on the bottom left, uh, rectennas. These are tiny little antennas, uh, not being used for uh, communication purposes, but for uh, uh, gen energy generation purposes. Um, and I think with that, we'll, uh, let's see, we're doing good with time. Uh, uh, let's go to the next slide, Gabby, I think. Yes. Um, Guys, we, we need to turn the floor over to you to um, give you a chance to ask questions uh, about anything with regards to our program, whether it's uh, how you apply, uh, how you select courses, requirements and all that. We will follow this up with uh, another session uh, in two weeks and we expect to have uh, six uh, to seven faculty members other than the three of us that you heard today, you, I hope you realize we try to represent the entire department, but we're going to ask the folks that do this work to be here and, and uh, take uh, directly the answer directly your questions. So um, 
we are uh, ready to take your questions. So far, I that we did. Go ahead. So far, I don't see any. They cannot speak, right? So that's uh, right. Okay. Just type. So we have Alejandro and Drake from FGCU. So if you guys have any questions, this is your chance. Let you think of a question uh, and I will start uh, speaking again. I want to thank you and congratulate you guys um, for your accomplishments so far. Um, I We're doing this because we do believe that a Master's of Science in Electrical Engineering is uh, a very important degree and a very important ambition to have. Um, the, the demand for uh, uh, electrical engineers with master's degrees is substantial. We keep getting calls um, from local companies that they are interested in um, graduates with master's degrees um, because that's how that, that's what the marketplace calls for today. They are looking for additional expertise. So uh, we certainly hope you consider this uh, seriously. If we can answer any questions, uh, reach out to us. If not today, any other time. I, um, our emails were on the first slide, and uh, you should be receiving additional information on this event uh, via email from us so that you can RSVP for the next one. Uh, if nobody has, uh, Gabby, you look like you want to say something? Yes, I do have a question. Go ahead. Uh, yes. This is from Drake. He's uh, the student from FGCU. He says, for a person contemplating a thesis versus non-thesis option, what would be some considerations to take? Um, so the first question, I, I'm assuming, uh, well, so do you like to do research, right? And if you like to do research, uh, what's the particular area? that you would have an interest and um, we can get into discussing the specific topic uh, of your interest by connecting you with the right faculty member. Um, it's uh, that my my personal take and, and my colleagues may disagree. I tell uh, students who plan to pursue a PhD degree not to do a thesis because they're going to do a dissertation. Uh, they can start their research, but not to focus on on doing a thesis. Just take coursework and continue to the PhD. If the master's degree is your is your terminal degree, I think thesis doing a thesis and engaging in research has some um, serious advantages over folks that only do um, coursework. Uh, and that doesn't mean that coursework the coursework option is is the wrong one. Um, uh, we, it's, it's quite a popular option, actually. I think most of our master students choose their uh, course only option. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, Drake, but you can get a little more specific and and between the three of us, we'll, we'll zoom in to providing a better answer. In the meantime, Alejandro um, wants to know where he can find the link for the second session in, on February 3rd. Oh, we're going to email. We're going to email that information because we're going to reach out again. But Alejandro, if you don't mind, um, I don't know how he can share. How can you share the email with us to make sure he's on our list? Also, I have their email addresses. You do good. OK, so you will be receiving an email uh, this this week and a reminder next week. Um, I, I don't know if Ismail or, or, or Drew, you guys want to add anything to the question of thesis versus no thesis? 
Because sometimes it comes down to the individual, as far as I see it. Not, I, thought, I you, thought you were fine, but uh, as you as you said, if 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 you think you want to leave with a master's degree, then then a thesis is a really good product to have in your under your belt, as far as uh, uh, demonstrating to employers that you have the ability to address and individually address a, a significant problem in electrical engineering. Um, we have a lot of thesis uh, uh, activity in the in our biomedical uh, engineering uh, program. I have I have students working on drug and gene delivery. Um, Dr. Sadow has has students working on uh, um, cancer therapies and uh, similar to what Dr. Uh, Usal talked about with uh, um, measuring brain waves and and controls of of uh, electronic systems. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Partha Sarathi is working on stroke detection and, and other aspects of uh, uh, interactions between electrical and, and biologic systems uh, using light, uh, spectral, spectral studies, that sort of thing. So there's a lot of exciting thesis opportunities out there. Uh, if you think you want to do a PhD, though, I, I kind of agree with Dr. Ferkides. If you want to do a PhD here, it's better to you know focus on getting your master's out of the way and then and then uh, start start working on research uh, in a particular laboratory. Um, if you want to do your PhD someplace else, it's important to demonstrate that you have master's capability. You know so. You, you can convince somebody you can do research somewhere else if you have a if you have a thesis document to send to them. So that's a little different than what Dr. Farrakides mentioned, but uh, yep. we have a pretty strong program in in biomedical engineering. Uh, Dr. Wong also uh, participates in that area. He's he's working on uh, on MEMS applications um, and and sensitive sensors so you know there's a lot of interesting and, and actually uh, innovative activity going on there and we're we're collaborating with our our students a great deal to have them pursue those those processes that's all i have to say about biomedical but uh, you know, come see us if you have an interest rate um, and I don't have, you know, much to add to what's uh, what's been said so far. But, and again, this is mostly my um, personal professional opinion: is if you are planning to do a master's degree with, um, you know, a little intention to maybe continue towards a PhD, um, then I would definitely very highly recommend that you do a thesis option because it uh, it tells the outside world that uh, you have the capability to add like you know dr frakiti said to do something novel right so to address either come up with a novel solution or to be able to test a novel solution and come out with some kind of scientific conclusion uh in regards to your analysis of a novel situation um, however, if you are already thinking of more advanced research and getting your PhD, uh, then masters become more of a uh, kind of a pathway where you can take these advanced courses to help you with uh, your PhD down the line. Um, as far as you know, my specific area, or let's say areas that include, say, machine learning and communications. Uh, I would say absolutely a thesis would help a lot for you to gain some, uh, you know, experience before you step out into the workforce where you, you know, uh, people may be demanding some some technical tools or knowledge from you that you may not have gotten from just taking a three credit course, for example. And instead, uh, you know, having engaged in some more advanced research uh, would pr probably provide you with a better uh, I would say set of tools to tackle problems down the line, either in the workforce or maybe down the line as a PhD 
uh, as a PhD student as well. So it's a personal choice, uh, but my choice, especially if you're undecided on the PhD, is to go with a, a thesis option. Thank you, Dr. Yusuf. He did um, write back saying that the answers were very helpful. And she said thank you to us. Thank you, Drake. Um, and I think Alejandro is no longer here, so I think we're just sticking around with Drake at the moment. All right, Drake, one, one last chance. <laughs> now that you've got us here. Mm -hmm. Yep, an entire department. Don't don't let this chance go by. <laughs> I do want to remind Drake that starting at 530, you guys have the virtual tour. So that will run from 530 to 6 p.m. And there is a different link for that. Gabby, yeah, like it's okay. All right, so I I think I don't see any more questions, Gabby. I don't know if I'm delayed over here. Do you see anything? Nope, we're good. All right, so in that case, uh, thanks for joining us, Drake. Congratulations on your uh, accomplishments and choices, and uh, we wish you well. Let us know if we can help you going forward. All right, take care. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, hey, thank you, everybody.